Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, no, Mark. Yes, Mark. Mark. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> Brian's uh, next up. But uh, yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity and for, for coming today to, um, to participate in this talk. So we will uh, discuss two technologies. One is DocStore and one is uh, DNA Stack. And both of them are kind of cohesively melded together to create a, a platform for reproducible bioinformatics on the cloud. Uh, my name is Mark Fiume. I'm CEO of a company called DNA Stack. We're based in Toronto, Canada. But I also work for the Global Alliance in the context of a data sharing initiative called Beacon. Uh, very excited to have uh, with me Brian O'Connor, who is uh, the technical director of the computational genomics platform at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, but Brian also is a tremendous leader in the area of uh, bioinformatics on the cloud, and he co-chairs the containers and workflows task team as part of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. So um, most of us are familiar with uh, the exponential increases in genomics and omics data. Uh, so in the next 10, five to 10 years, we expect that we will have a $100 genome. There will be about 200 whole genome sequenced sequences that have been processed, uh, and that will generate about two to 40 exabytes worth of data. So a tremendous amount of data will be, will be generated. And so needless to say, uh, we really need to rethink how we analyze and share data at this kind of scale. So the traditional model we think will not work, um, and the traditional model is that where you have a centralized uh, repository of data, and the way that you compute on that data is to download copies of them onto your local infrastructure uh, where you have some custom computational processing pipeline that, that produces results and is analyzed locally. Uh, so for the reasons that we mentioned previously in terms of the tremendous growth in the volumes of genomics sequence data, but also in the context of, of the sensitivity of transferring that data around the internet. We think that a new model uh, is, is needed. And so the new model is, instead of moving data to the computation, is to move computation to the data. And so that's the premise of the technologies that we'll be presenting today is underpinned by this philosophy. So there's there are many advantages to the new model uh, that's proposed here. So sharing is in the new model is actually true sharing. You're not copying or creating mirrors of, of data sets. You're actually sharing a single resource. Uh, because we have this centralized model and because you're actually sharing computational descriptions, uh, these can be based on standards as opposed to the local infrastructure where there's less policy and, and less ability to enforce standards. Uh, reproducibility just falls out of this by virtue of the fact that we can now very efficiently uh, copy and share uh, our computational descriptions. Uh, security is centralized because the data does not move. It's analyzed in place. And thanks to cost efficiencies that are uh, provided by economies of scale, by commercial cloud providers, um, this on a five-year time horizon, when you do the expectations on costs, ends up being the most cost-effective uh, uh, solution, and this is decreasing exponentially. So we're going to show you some new ways that you can write, share, find, and run bioinformatics workflows in the cloud. Again, these technologies are based on principles that are being supported by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, and principally those are security, reproducibility, federation, cost efficiency, and scale. Uh, so this is a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about over the course of the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, so the first part, we will talk about DocStore, uh, which is a platform that uh, Brian and others have created for sharing and finding bioinformatics workflows among the community. The second part will go into detail in terms of how you write workflows that are compatible with this format. And typically, we'll, we'll look at the workflow description language, but there's also uh, another language called CWL, the Common Workflow Language, which was touched on, I believe, earlier today. It shares similar principles. Uh, once you have uh, the efficiencies of DocStore for uh, writing and publishing your workflows online. We want to show you some, some really great integration that we're excited to, to actually debut here uh, at ISNB for actually running those workflows uh, in the DNA Stack platform. Uh, so now we have uh, Dr. Brian O'Connor, uh, who, who is the co-chair of the Containers uh, and Workflows task team for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. If you're not familiar with the GA4GH, uh, I really encourage you to um, look at the scope of what's being 
develop there. And if you're interested in this area, either contact myself or Brian to get involved. So Brian, thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. So I'm going to cover part one, which is all about sharing and finding uh, workflows from uh, the platform doc store, which Mark uh, mentioned. Um, so just to take a step back first, though, I want to talk a little bit about the core technology behind doc store, and that is Docker. And I, I'm always kind of curious, uh, uh, people in the audience, who regularly uses Docker? I'm just kind of curious what the mix is. Okay, so maybe like a third or a half. Um, so for those of you that haven't played around with it, Docker is a really transformative technology um, because what it lets you do is it lets you package up your tools, configs, reference files into this lightweight, highly mobile image, right? Something that you can move around very, very easily. Uh, these are typically Linux-based, um, suppo uh, supported on um, uh, sort of uh, hosting systems uh, running in Linux or Windows or Mac OS. So you can actually run this Linux tool on a variety of different platforms. And it's very popular within the general IT community. So that means a lot of companies, a lot of individuals, developers out there are using Docker to share their services and their, their tools with the community. And as a consequence of that, um, there are fantastic tools out there, things like Quay.io and Docker Hub that really, really help to build and share um, these Docker-based tools. Um, can we apply Docker to genomics and is that successful? And, and I would say uh, without a doubt, yes. And the reason for that is because um, looking at projects like PCOG, so this is pan cancer analysis of whole genomes, I think it illustrates a lot of the power of Dockerized based tools and how we can leverage Docker in the context of cloud environments. So this is a project that started a, about three years ago. Um, the computation for it largely wrapped up about a year ago. Uh, and it's still ongoing right now in terms of publications being put together, which is very exciting to see. Um, but it came out of the ICGC, or International C uh, Cancer Genome Consortium. And the idea behind this project is, right, we have 2,800 cancer donors. Uh, corresponds to about 5,800 whole human genomes. So it's one of the largest cancer whole genome data sets out there. And our goal was to consistently analyze that data, to eliminate sort of computational batch effects. So to this point, ICGC had a whole host of, of different workflows that the data was run through, depending on the source organization. So this was the first attempt to kind of harmonize, uh, computationally harmonize the analysis of these samples. Um, the challenge was, though, that this was an inherently geographically distributed project. So we had eight sites where the data lived, and we had 14 cloud and HPC environments where we could do compute. So this is really getting us to Mark's point. Uh, that old model of pulling all the data into one location and processing it and then pushing the data back, that wasn't going to work for PCOG. So we needed to look at ways of encapsulating our workflows and sending them to where the data was, uh, was living or was close by. And so that's exactly what we did. When we started the project, we would actually leverage cloud environments and we would build up virtual machines and install all of our software with things called Ansible scripts. You can think of them kind of like bash scripts. So we'd build up these virtual machines. It would take a long time to do it. If any of them went offline, it was really a pain to go back and, and, and recreate those. And so about a year into the course of the Peacock project, Docker reached its 1.0 production release, and that really transformed the project. So what we ended up doing there is we ended up Dockerizing our core analysis workflows. That included our BWA alignment, um, three best practice somatic calling workflows from Sanger, DKFZ, Emble, and the Broad, and also downstream filtering and uh, merging um, uh, consensus calling uh, tools. So we actually dockerized those up into these highly mobile images. And what did that allow us to do in PCOG? Well, it allowed us to be much more nimble in our sort of sending the computation to where the data lived. So we ended up building an infrastructure after many iterations that leveraged these Docker containers. Uh, we had a centralized index that told us where the particular data sets lived across these eight storage environments and 14 compute environments. And from that index, we're able to determine uh, we're going to run this workflow in this cloud because the data is resident there. Um, that means that we had a cloud shepherd that would basically enqueue uh, the work for that cloud environment. 
and that cloud orchestration um, engine that we'd have in each cloud environment, uh, that would basically launch virtual machines which would quickly pull in the Docker-based workflow and execute it. So it eliminated a whole bunch of um, sort of very cost, um, uh, a, a time expensive and error prone sort of provisioning. It meant that we could very simply spin up worker VMs with these Docker based workflows and uh, process the data very quickly um, and it, at a sort of high level of fidelity in terms of if we lost a VM, it was no big deal. We could very quickly uh, replace that VM and replace that work. So this actually really helped the Peacock project. It was really transformative for Peacock and really underscores that idea that we can actually be successful at sending the analysis to where the data lives, that that actually is a great model. Um, Docker was a key part of that, um, but what we kind of found towards the end of the Peacock analysis was that we needed more. Um, so Docker was great for solving one of two key problems. Uh, namely the reproducibility. So I can package up my tools, I can send it from cloud to cloud, VM to VM, server to server, and be guaranteed that that is going to run properly on anything that supports Docker. So that is something that we were able to prove in Peacock and show that that works. Where Peacock was limited though is we really needed a way to describe in this Docker container you will find this tool on this path. It requires these inputs, it makes these outputs, it needs this number of cores to run. That description or that descriptor was really missing. So that's a key feature of DocStore, that together with this reproducibility inherent to Docker containers, um, the links to a workflow descriptor or tool descriptor in either common workflow language or Whittle, both of which Mark uh, mentioned earlier, was really a key innovation of DocStore. It's bringing those two things together. So how does DocStore work? I won't go too much into the details of this figure, but the idea behind DocStore is we're not intending to replace the tools that you know and love. Uh, we all work with GitHub or Bitbucket. We like those quite a bit. Everyone leverages those, or most people leverage those in their research for storing their code. Uh, we like things like Quay.io or Docker Hub. Again, these are best of breed tools that came out of the IT community that are actually really great. So what DocStore really is, it's a registry that sits on top of these well-loved tools. And for instance, on the left-hand side, I can put in my Docker file, which is my recipe for how to build my Docker image, and my descriptor in CWL or Whittle into GitHub. And I can link that to Quay, and Quay will dutifully build my Docker image and host it for free, which is a fantastic service. And once I have those two components, I can go ahead and go onto DocStore and register that. And DocStore will bring the information together from Quay and, and GitHub uh, in a single place and expose that through a GA4GH tool registry um, API standard called Terse. So what does that look like from a user perspective? Well, we have a, um, uh, a slick, nice looking uh, performant website that people can go to to browse our content, look at our documentation, reach out to us on Gitter and other uh, mechanisms to get support. Um, it also includes a live search functionality, so you can do a live search based on description and other sort of fields. And this live search will actually be supplemented by a nice fasted search that we're targeting for the sort of November timeframe uh, that should really add a little value here in terms of being able to uh, look up tools based on uh, what type of tool it is, whether it's an alignment or a somatic variant caller and other sort of facets. And once you actually find the tool that you're interested in, again, DocStore as a registry is bringing a ton of information together from a ton of different sources. And you can see here on the screenshot, we've got things like uh, the author information, the last time this was built on Quay. You can see information about uh, links out to the source for this tool, links out to uh, the Docker images. And most importantly, towards the bottom, we have a mechanism for launching this tool in a very simplified command line interface. So we like that because it gives people the ability to find tools on DocStore and quickly try them out, essentially kick the tires on the tool on their local um, workstation or, or their VM. So that's what it looks like from a user perspective. That's the, uh, essentially the goal of DocStore is to solve those two problems I told you about. What about from a producer perspective, from a tool author or workflow author perspective? 
Um, so we have detailed documentation on DocStore. We really want to grow the community and have a lot of people uh, make tools and workflows and share them in this way. Uh, so we have a detailed um, tutorial online, which is about an hour long tutorial that'll take you from start to finish. Um, I clearly don't have an hour here, so I'm gonna give you the five minute compressed version of that tutorial. So as a workflow or tool author, um, the first step is to go ahead and dockerize your tool. Um, so Docker uh, provides a Docker file with a very simple uh, uh, format for um, deriving from an existing Docker container, in this case Ubuntu 12, uh, adding in software. You can basically think of it as very much like a bash script with some extra syntax. Once I've made my Docker file or my recipe for my Docker-based uh, tool, I put that on a GitHub repo like uh, a Git repo like GitHub or Bitbucket and I can point Quay to it to actually build and host that Docker image. That's a very convenient service. So step two as a, as a tool author here is to then describe that Docker um, uh, image uh, so that people can understand, both people and computers can understand what is the tool inside that Docker, uh, what are its inputs, what are its outputs, what are its runtime requirements? This was a big missing piece that we didn't have in PCOG, and we were really delighted to see that CWL and Whittle both provide this functionality of very clearly defining and telling uh, you as a user what is inside a Docker image and how to execute it. So once we have that descriptor as a workflow or tool author, I'm gonna put that on my GitHub repo as well. And then the third step is to actually provide test data, and this is another thing that we found incredibly important in the Peacock project and other projects as well, is it's oftentimes not enough to say, oh, this takes a VCF file as an input. It is actually incredibly helpful to have example, publicly downloadable example data that's ready to go and been validated to work with that tool. That's incredibly helpful for people both to make sure that you can run the tool properly on your side as a user, um, but also to get good examples of what inputs really look like for a given tool. And so in this example, I'm showing um, putting together a test JSON file, which is again stored on GitHub along with my Docker file and descriptor, and that'll be uh, a test data set that people can run, um, and I can also use to test my own system. Um, you can have multiple JSONs here. You can have multiple test profiles, essentially, that allows you to do things like a small genome, a uh, single chromosome test data set, and a large whole genome test data set, for example. And then finally, the fourth step uh, is really quite simple. You log on to DocStore. You give it some privileges to access your GitHub and Quay and other accounts. And then once you've done that, you'll actually see all the tools that Quay has been building for you and can conveniently navigate to the tool that you're interested in publishing and essentially hit the button that says publish. If you followed our standard development procedure, we auto detect all this information, the Docker file, the descriptor, the test JSON files, and really it, just do, it does come down to hitting the publish button. If you want to customize things, you can go in and edit as well, but at this point, what's happened, and this particular example in our tutorial was based on Callisto, um, this shows that the Callisto tool, once I hit the publish button, is now available on DocStore, and people can find it and see a similar uh, sort of interface that I showed you earlier that gives you all the details about that tool, how to call it, how to link back to its source code, its, its Docker information, and so on and so forth. Another really key thing here is because we're, you know, basing things on GitHub and Quay.io, both of those have support for tagging or releasing uh, tools, and we encourage people to use that. What that allows you to do is publish multiple versions of your tools or workflows on DocStore. And this is really important. If you're a scientist coming into DocStore and want to run a tool uh, that's a few releases old, but uh, you want to run that tool because you have a large compendium of data that you want to analyze some new data to add into, being able to get back to an older version is actually really important for scientific reproducibility. So this is a key feature. Um, the other thing, again, as a sort of um, registry pulling information from a lot of sources, we do pull that information in so you can actually browse the low-level information like the Docker file or the CWL descriptor or see the actual test JSON files. And the final thing that I, I just want to point out is um, once I've registered as a workflow or tool author and it's been published on DocStore, 
um, myself or others can use our simple doc store command line to kick the tires. Again, I've mentioned this earlier, but the idea behind here is we provide a very, very simple tool that you can use on your local workstation or you can use on a, a cloud VM. Um, that tool allows you to pull in files from URLs, pull in Docker images, execute a given tool from DocStore, and then provision those files back out, either to the local file system, to S3, or another location. So this is a standardized DocStore command line. Any tool or any workflow you find on DocStore will be executable in the same way, and it's a great way to go ahead and kick the tires. That being said, um, this is just one of the ways that we want people to be able to execute tools that they find on DocStore. So what I'm really excited to talk about today and mention today is that uh, DNA Stack is the first commercial platform that we've actually integrated directly into DocStore. So when you browse Whittle content, a Whittle workflow on DocStore, you actually get a nice link that will take you to DNA Stack where you can execute that Whittle-based workflow. And likewise, on DNA Stack, you can actually do an import from DocStore. So that's very powerful because now, in addition to the simplified command line, you now have a scalable platform that you can run the same tool that you kick the tires on locally at scale on, on the cloud environment, a commercial cloud environment. Um, so with that, I want to hand this back over to Mark. And um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brian. So, so if, if you haven't seen DocStore yet, uh, please go to docstore.org and, and flip through it. It is a, a large and growing repository of, of valuable workflows. And so uh, at DNA Stack, we asked ourselves, how, how can we contribute to this and how can we take it to the next level where we actually are now empowering bioinformaticians to marry the, the, the workflow recipes with massive computational architecture that allows you to actually deploy these things at scale. So uh, I want to talk briefly before I get into um, the demonstration of that integration, uh, briefly about writing workflows in, in Whittle format. So uh, if you're a bioinformatician or a script writer, uh, you can probably appreciate this part. It's, uh, it, Whittle is, uh, is quite a human readable and writable format for kind of a platform agnostic definition language for your bioinformatics. So here's a is example Whittle task where we, we start the block with a, a task and then the name of the task uh, and it has four essential elements. One is uh, the set of inputs which uh, you have primitives here of string, file, floats and ints. Uh, the second block is a command block which is essentially the set of command line uh, 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 arguments and, and uh, uh, commands that you execute against your inputs. And here you're just using dollar sign notation to refer to the inputs. Uh, each task has a set of outputs which you can then define. And again, there are those primitive types. Uh, and then the last block here is the runtime, which allows you to describe the shape of the virtual machine image in which this lives. And this is, again, a, a Docker-based uh, definition of the, the virtual machine. Uh, so one thing to note here is that you have fine-grained control on a task level of the shape of your virtual machine image. So you're not provisioning a very bulky instance and running an entire workflow in the context of that instance. You are uh, very nicely and optimally shaping the instance to fit uh, the needs of that task only. So once you've defined a set of tasks in Whittle, you then chain them together through a workflow. So here is now a workflow definition where we're defining a workflow called BAM stats. Again, this has uh, some elements here. So it has inputs and outputs in the same way that tasks do. Uh, but in the middle, we have calls to tasks. So here we've defined uh, tasks called uh, SAM stats above, and here we're executing calls based on the inputs of this, uh, of this particular workflow. So as you can see, it's a very, very human readable and writable, very quick way to define uh, your tasks and your workflows to combine them together. Uh, one of the, the questions that we often get is how, how does this help distributed computing? How does this help scale? So uh, this is a scatter operation, which is essentially a distributed computer compute for loop, um, which says for every uh, element in this array, execute this task. And this will, uh, again, distribute for every single element in that array uh, the work across that particular task. And then you can coalesce all these outputs back into at the end of the task. Um, so that's a very brief overview of Whittle. Uh, I encourage you to just, just Google workflow description language. And there's, a, I think it's a 36 page long 
uh, uh, documentation with a lot of uh, valuable examples. So if you're interested, uh, please do look at that resource. Okay, so I, I'm now excited to, to show you how we can combine all these technologies and platform agnostic workflow definition languages and the, the valuable repository of, of uh, bioinformatics workflows that are defined in these language, languages and provide an environment that allows you to efficiently test these and run these at scale. Uh, so this is where the platform DNA stack comes in. Uh, so, so about DNA Stack, we're a genomic software and service company. We're based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, we're headquartered in Johnson & Johnson's incubator called JNJ, uh, J-Labs. And uh, because we uh, believe so much in the mission of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, we actually spend a large majority of our time actually contributing to that effort. Uh, we believe in the future of open, federated standards-based bioinformatics, especially um, in the context in which we're talking today. Uh, so we were the first uh, genomics partners of the Google Cloud uh, and we're actively growing. And so uh, if you're a bioinformatician who's, who likes this kind of work, uh, please do reach out to us. Uh, so we have three roles in general. So uh, first and foremost, we provide our software as a technology, as a service. So you can go on to app.dnastack.com and have access to our platform. And essentially what we'd like to do is empower the bioinformatics community and not compete. So our platform is meant to be a technical catalyst for bioinformatics work that just gets out of the way and allows you to focus on the science of genomics and not how much infrastructure I have or how do I provision my hardware or storage, for example. Uh, the second role is as a service provider. And so um, typically we see this in clinical labs where they don't have uh, on-site bioinformaticians and they like bioinformatics expertise. So we actually have bioinformaticians that we kind of lend out that help with migration from local on-prem solutions into a cloud compatible future. Uh, and then the last uh, role that we have is as part of the standards community, again, embedding ourselves in the fabric of the GA4GH and trying to be an enterprise grade implementation of the, the standards that are emerging out of that community. Uh, so the platform has a tremendous capacity thanks to our ability to leverage commercial cloud platforms. We have uh, virtually unlimited hot and cold storage. We have uh, on-demand access to 32,000 cores, which is growing to 60,000 cores. Uh, and so we estimate that we can process a quarter million whole genome samples uh, according to best practices uh, annually. And so um, the challenge uh, for bioinformaticians in the audience is to, to try to, to uh, reach capacity of, of the platform. But thanks to the tremendous investments of folks like Google and Amazon, um, the quotas for these kinds of compute are, are large and growing, and they totally appreciate the growth in genomics and are seeing this as a big opportunity as well. So they're happy to support this kind of growth. Uh, so our platform has a, a few different functionalities. Uh, essentially, on high level, we do storage, uh, bioinformatics, variant search, variant interpretation, variant sharing, and visualization. The component that we're just going to focus on for the purpose of today is bioinformatics, and especially in the context of our integration with DocStore. So our bioinformatics application is called Workflows, uh, and the intent is to empower anyone with an internet connection to be able to run any workflow, including those on DocStore, at any scale. So I want to give you a, a demonstration of the platform and, and specifically highlight the DocStore integration. But uh, as we go through this, uh, I, I know there's a lot of bioinformaticians in the audience, so we'll show a lot of graphical user interface clicking, um, and that's useful for a demo, but we, we also appreciate completely that um, it's sometimes the most efficient thing to just talk to our REST API. Uh, and so for that purpose, we do have command line uh, application, and we have Java libraries for you to integrate programmatically with our platform. Okay, so we'll start with uh, uploading and bringing data into the DNA stack system. There's three ways you can do this. You can go onto our website at app.dnastack.com, create a project, and literally drag and drop some files into the interface. We wanted to make this as easy as uploading videos onto, say, YouTube, where you just drag files in, you specify some metadata about the samples, the data is streamed securely into our cloud platform, uh, and it's ready to be analyzed. The second way you can do it is through a command line interface, which we will show. And the third way is actually laterally transferring data from an existing cloud provider. So we can actually integrate with the Google Cloud Platform, Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, to transfer data that may be in other environments. Okay. 
So once data is into the system, either through the command line interface or through the drag and drop process, uh, your data can be ready to be executed through uh, a suite of bioinformatics applications. So these applications uh, can be either best practices, which we provide, kind of we stock the shelves with some preliminary valuable applications, but we're also reaching out to the community to try to understand what are the most valuable workflows that you would like to see either in our platform uh, and also contributed to back to the community in, the, in into platforms like DocStore. Uh, so here we have uh, the Broad's best practices exome, uh, exome whittle. Uh, and actually, it, it probably looks a little grainy, just realizing it looks a little grainy, but bear with uh, the resolution here. Uh, what's being highlighted on the screen is actually the runtime block for this best practices pipeline. Uh, and the beauty of taking something like Whittle and allowing you to deploy it on the DNA stack platform is you can literally, almost literally, ask for any amount of computational resource capacity that you'd like. So if you want more CPUs, you just ask for CPUs, uh, and we're able to scale it um, dynamically on demand. So. so once you've defined your workflow, um, you then are presented with a very simple interface for you to be able to click uh, and specify the inputs. So here is a, a display of the run page where you could actually uh, enter in all the parameters for your workflow. And that integrates with the data that you've uploaded previously. We also have the ability to store default values. So if you find yourself uh, quite often using the same parameters for 90% uh, of the inputs, you can save those as defaults and only iterate on, say, the sample or um, sample name for example. So here it's showing that ability to, to grab a, a set of default values and only specify inputs for a sample. And in future releases of our front end, you'll be able to uh, use this interface to construct batches where uh, you have a set of default values for most of your input arguments, but you can, say, run against a thousand samples at once using uh, the interface itself. So it will be a powerful way to execute your bioinformatics at scale but also through a, a very nice and simple user interface. Okay, so now for, for the, the good part. Um, this is the integration of DocStore with DNA Stack Platform. So uh, we've been very grateful to collaborate with the DocStore team to implement this integration where if you find a workflow uh, that has a WDL definition, we actually have embedded a link, you can see it on the, the right side of the screen, where it says launch with and there's a DNA stack button. So this makes any workflow that's on DocStore that you'd like to run able to, with a push of a button, integrate with our platform. So when you click on that link, it takes you into the DNA stack platform. You choose which project you would like to import this to. You click import and that becomes among the suite of workflows that you can run in much the same way as everything you've seen previously to this. So you now have a nice user interface that you can specify uh, your input parameters. You can grab files in your project that are private to you and run this workflow. The second format of the integration with DocStore is the ability to grab DocStore workflows from directly within DNA stack. So you don't even have to leave the platform. So if you go to uh, create workflow, there's a button called import from DocStore, and this pulls up dynamically from the DocStore platform uh, and lists all the Whittle-based workflows that are available to you, and you can select from among those to import as well. So here we've imported uh, basically a hello world workflow from DocStore, it's called WhaleSay. Uh, it takes one input, which is uh, someone's name, and it just echoes it back out. Um, so we, through this example, we just want to show how you can take a DocStore workflow and then customize it if you'd like to extend it or add custom parameters, et cetera. Uh, so here, the hello world example uh, is listed as part of your, your workflows in the workflows application. You click the edit button, and now you have an interactive development environment where you're writing Whittle-based workflows. 
uh, and it actually does some validation below so you know whether your Whittle is actually valid or not. And here we're extending this workflow to add first name and last name instead of just uh, a single name. And so once we save this workflow, uh, it's saved as a new version, and every single run of that workflow uh, is saved with the version in which it was run, and you also get the interface with two input parameters now. It's uh, kind of a nice uh, dynamic update of the, of the workflow. Okay. So finally, for the bioinformaticians in the audience uh, who care much less about uh, the pixels on the screen just want access to the platform itself. The idea was to create a one-line uh, execution uh, command that allows you to deploy a workflow. Uh, so it may be a little bit grainy for you to see here, but this is our command line interface for deploying a workflow. Uh, and the inputs to this are username, password, organization ID, project ID, the ID of the workflow, the version of the workflow, and the inputs to this workflow uh, as JSON. And if you supply this, you can, from the command line, execute any workflow in the platform. So once this is executed, it actually produces a JSON, which describes the job. Um, and then you can also use the command line interface to pull the job for status updates. So here, job status is not started, but you, we have an API as well for checking in on, on the status of the job. And you actually will get email notifications when the job is complete as well. Okay. So as we wrap up, uh, we are now in the process of stocking the shelves with useful workflows. So now it's about reaching out to the community and trying to understand what workflows can we write that will be value to you in the context of the DNA stack platform, but also in the context of DocStore. Uh, so here is the list of off-the-shelf workflows that we've written Whittle definitions for. So for alignment and calling, we have Rhodes Best Practices. We have Verily's Deep Variance, which is in beta testing. We have Sention's Align and Call, which is a quicker version of the Rhodes Best Practices. Uh, we have variant annotation pipelines, we have statistics, but the question now is, well, what workflows would you like us to write? And we actually have a concierge service that will actually write your workflows uh, in collaboration or for you. So that brings us to our pricing model. It's uh, one of the questions that, that uh, we're, we're pretty consistently asked is, is in the context of other bioinformatics applications, how do you compare in, the, in terms of pricing? Uh, so the good news is for researchers, our platform is entirely free. So there's no monthly subscription cost, there's no annual subscription cost. It's absolutely free for you to sign up for our platform. The only thing that you pay for are the consumables in terms of compute and storage. So it's very much like a surrogate cloud provider in that sense. Uh, the last component is optional if you don't have a bioinformatics team. Uh, typically, we see this in a clinical context. We have a concierge service, again, to write workflows and to migrate folks onto the platform. Um, so this is uh, an example of the, the cloud costs you could expect from running uh, workflows within the context of DNA stack. So to compute with best practices on a whole genome sequence of about 30x, it's about $15. Uh, to store it, it's about $5 per sample per year. And for exome, it's $3 and $1, respectively. Okay, so wrapping up, we started by talking about tremendous growth in our industry in, in the form of data and sensitivity, and the argument uh, is that we need to shift paradigms from a move the data to the computation to moving the computation to the data. The Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is a global collaboration of upwards of 700 members that are working together to collectively usher in new standards for doing bioinformatics that are more open, reproducible, and scalable than the traditional model. Uh, the bioinformatics group, uh, and specifically the group that Brian leads as part of the containers and workflows task team, is leading the way in ushering in these new standards and proposing Docker-based tools with workflow description languages that are agnostic to uh, the computational hardware on which it runs represents, I think, the most significant step towards solidifying this direction. Uh, we demonstrated DocStore, which is a very convenient place to share and to find workflows that are defined by the community. And we also demonstrated DNA Stack as a scalable 
platform in which to run these tools. We also demonstrated the integration of these tools together uh, in order to make the growing library of workflows that are available on DocStore with a push button or a single line execution deployed at scale uh, with massively, uh, massive compute architecture and a completely managed experience. So we think that combining uh, both workflow definition languages with massive computational hardware in a managed environment, in addition to future integrations with data registries, that these three things together will form the basis of bioinformatics in the future. Uh, so with that, I'd really like to uh, thank the folks uh, at DocStore who made this integration possible, Brian and Dennis, who's also here, uh, the DNA Stack team, Milan and William, who are also here, and all of the folks as part of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that are working towards uh, this common vision. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll take a break for questions, uh, and if you don't have the opportunity to ask your question, we also have a booth, uh, it's uh, booth number 11, but feel free to find us or contact us by email. So thank you. Thanks a lot for an amazing talk to both of you. Questions? So, okay. uh, with DocStore, you said also works with tools uh, that you want to mine in, where the data resides in the cloud, not necessarily in your platform. Is that correct? The data does not need to reside in your platform. I can use that tool. And then the second question, let me just give the question of setup. That one, how do you do the requirement for the tool knowing the format of the data, right? Right, okay, so, so the first question is, the, you know, DocStore is, is a registry, right? So our goal is to, to have a standardized way to share these tools and workflows um, and to have many different platforms to run them on. So I showed you the command line that we have with DocStore. That knows how to work with local files on your local computer or it work with, works with files in S3 or Google storage or other places. Um, DNA Stack is, is similar in the sense that you can onboard data into their system and use tools that you find in DocStore through their system to leverage those files that are stored on the cloud. So there's a lot of flexibility there and I'm expecting other platforms and other um, uh, tools uh, to be made available that know how to pull in tools and workflows from DocStore to use them. And they may have their own platform requirements or their own limitations, or their own uh, specialties in terms of where they allow you to get data from and put data to. And so your second question was, um, how do you enforce anything about what the inputs would look like? And I would say there's, there's two things on DocStore. Right, okay, so I, I would say two things. One, from like a human perspective, since you have this test data, that's actually quite helpful as a human being to look at like known good test data. Okay, the food parameter is this file. I can get that file and look at it and see exactly what you know, input that is. On the flip side of this, things like CWL or Whittle, um, I know off the top of my head, CWL supports the idea of having um, a data type using Edom ontology terms. And so there's an ontology there where you can describe this is a BAM file, and this is a BAM file described by this ontology term. So it, becomes, it can be, become very specific in terms of saying this is exactly what the input type is for the parameter foo. Um, there is some wiggle room there, but that's, again, one of the reasons why I think it's important to have example test data associated with these tools as well to kind of eliminate some of that ambiguity. So um, first of all, this is this is fantastic work. The uh, the amount of reproducibility um, at the at the level of the, uh, at the level of software interfaces is really really impressive. Um, I'm curious. So you're this is this is all running at scale now, um, and there are there's a, a significant amount of effort that's going into um, building tools. So you're going out in the community. You're asking for tools to be to be deposited. Um, to be integrated into workflows. Um, how confident are you that the, um, that the, the Linux containerized, um, that basically the Linux containers are a really, uh, aren't a leaky abstraction? You mean in terms of security or? Well, so in terms of security and in terms of um, compatibility. Hmm. 
Mark, do you have any thoughts on this? Or? I, yeah. I mean, I, I have some thoughts on my side in terms of, you know, we're, we're working with Docker right now, and who knows five years from now, will Rocket be the next big mm -hmm. thing that everyone wants, or will Docker version whatever break backwards compatibility? There is some risk there. I, I mean, I, I, th I think, though, that we're in a situation with how popular Docker is, that we will be in a situation that we can run our containers five, ten years from now. I, I don't think we'll be in a situation where they stop working. Um, but it is something that we should think about as a community. And Docker is hot right now. There may be other things out there that are, you know, equally hot in the future. And the, the field may, may, you know, change over time. But I think that shouldn't prevent us from using the technology that's really well adapted to our use cases now and actually does provide a huge amount of value right now. So I, uh, so I agree mm -hmm. um, that it, it's providing value now. So just for context, um, at, at my center we use, uh, we use Docker extensively. Um, so I'm, I'm not beating up on it. But, mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm less concerned about the, uh, about the implementation of the, of the open container runtime and more about the fact that we're pushing in. So basically, um, every one of these components is carrying an entire Linux runtime with it. And first of all, there's a huge security service there. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all, um, there's, a, there's pretty large uh, kernel compatibility service. Um, so uh, specifically, just, I was doing a little digging as I was thinking about this. So between uh, kernel version 3.1, which is Ubuntu 14, so that's probably what most people are carrying around on their laptop, and Ubuntu 16, um, which is what you're going to get if you go and buy a new laptop. There are 6,000 um, either added or deprecated kernel symbols. Um, and the problem is, you know, we're just packaging this stuff up, and it will literally just break. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm concerned about this, about the idea that these things are really immutable, that they're going to be forward compatible. Um, when, you know, and that we're going to have this big ecosystem of stuff that will break, um, maybe not in the two-year time frame, mm -hmm. which is basically the time that this is all matured, but I'm not as confident about the five mm -hmm. or ten. Mm -hmm. So I, don't I have mean, an I think it's yeah, I think it's a good point. I think you know we don't have a, a, a clear answer. I think what we see now is an improvement of the situation that we have um, we had before. But you know, hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the general adoption rate in the IT industry will help soften some of the blows that mm -hmm. could come from incompatibility because clearly Quay.io and Docker Hub and you know, Docker Incorporated, they're not going to want to have a situation where all these hosted containers you know, mm -hmm. rot essentially on their service over time. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see paths to compatibility in the future, but it's a, it's a great point and it's something that a lot of us don't think too much about because Docker is magic and it just works, right? <laughs> Um, the other thing to think about kind of related to this is you go on Quay.io and what I find interesting is they do security uh, scans of your Docker images, right? So that's very cool, mm -hmm. but what happens when you want to run this thing and you're, you, know, you go back in time because you need to compare your data to a large cohort, you're going to be perhaps running something that has what we now know as security vulnerabilities. So in these systems like DNA Stack and other systems mm -hmm. that run these Docker containers, they do need to add, you know, sort of extra layer on top to make sure that you can't arbitrarily expose those to the, the internet, for example, right? So we've got to look at ways of protecting these potentially old containers that may have security risks associated with them. I think that's a real thing. Great point. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go on. Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah, did, you did, uh, I think you did a tremendous effort here. So I have seen you listed uh, a few tools that you integrated in your uh, doc store. Yeah. Uh, like uh, FastQC or, yeah, these ones. Um, I mean, why these ones? I mean, uh, do the tool that you have there are passing a quality check on your site before? Being, because I think these tools are available for the people to be you know, arranged in a workflow, I guess. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is it correct? So why you select those ones? Is the community that tells you what tools they want to have there in order to... How do you... So, so to be clear, these are the off-the-shelf workflows in the DNA stack platform. The list that's available on Docstore is actually much more, mm -hmm. much longer than this and maybe more comprehensive. 
the ones that we are working towards in the context of DNA Stack is a lot about listening to the community. And so we've, we've reached out to the community and said, what are the basic workflows that you'd like to run? Um, and this is still an open question. It's a nascent platform. Um, so this is, I hope that answers your question. It's, it's kind of a best effort to serve the folks that we're talking to right now. That's it. Thanks. One more question. Hi. Um, so two questions. Um, I noticed you talked a lot about uh, Google Cloud, yep. I believe. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the decision between that versus AWS? And maybe a second part is, um, is it possible to choose the data center that you have the um, it run on in particular? Or is there anything around that? Great question. <laughs> OK, so, so the first one, the, the first question is, what is the distinction and decision points that, that influence Google versus Amazon? Um, Google was one of the first uh, partners in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which happened to be founded almost the same day as ours, uh, our company was. Um, and so uh, their vision, not only in providing a cloud service, but also in providing genomics APIs and being supportive of the community. Not to say that Amazon or Microsoft are not, because they are, in fact, very involved. Um, but for us, it made sense as a kind of strategic partner. And from, uh, from an offering perspective, um, for what the platform is built on. Uh, actually, it's fulfilling all of our needs right now from a service level. So um, actually, I think that we can be very competitive on price by virtue of some of the niceties of the Google Cloud. Um, and so, sorry, your, your second question was? The second question was, uh, can you choose a data center that you run on? Data center, right. So, so um, this is a kind of Q4, early 2018 Q1. Uh, um, issue for us. Um, so when you create a project in our platform, you'll be able to choose from among the data centers that our cloud providers that we've integrated with support. Great. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you very much again to the speakers. And thanks for your attention.